There we go. Awesome. Welcome, everybody, to another weekly call um, for Research Hub. Um, so wanted to start. We have a few topics today, but um, one of the first ones, and good thing, honestly, Kobe is here, so he can hopefully hear some of the feedback for it. Um, it's going to be just kind of what are, what are some of the, like the initial thoughts on the peer review feature. So this was like kind of a V1 feature that got pushed out um, last week and uh, just kind of want to hear what some people's thoughts on it are and like what maybe they would like to add on to that and uh, what their experience has been if they did um, do a peer review. So I think it looks great. I, I tried it today because I basically, yeah, I made a peer review today. Uh, looks great. I really like the the bottom with all the, you know, the, the dots. Um, so right now it looks like a, basically like a comment with a, with a score. Uh, I like this like free format submission. Uh, I'm just wondering like if in the future we would like, we are thinking about like structuring it a, a little bit more, just having like checklists for specific things that we want to check to actually give a, an objective score more than a subjective one. But you know, for now it looks, looks great. Looks, looks really cool. Yeah, so totally. We've definitely been thinking a lot about that. I know Kobe has some like checklists in mind. Sort of the way we were thinking about it initially was to to get something freeform out there, as you said, and see how people use it, and then like take that feedback from the first month and potentially bake in like specific categories. Um, I know Nathan, you had suggested a while back like the Cochrane. I forget the exact term. I've looked it up a bunch of times, but like there are smarter people than us who have thought of like what categories should go into a peer review, like when evaluating an article. So yeah, we, we like just to see like how people use it at first and then we'll probably bake in scores. And then even maybe there might be like a, like an expert score versus like a, you know, casual crowd sco score and there may be different kind of categories for each too. So what, what do you all think? Like, do you think it's important to have um, like specific categories for more like objective style reviews? Yes, Nathan. Yeah, sorry, I, I haven't had the chance. Um, obviously, I, I wasn't quite on the site at the start of this week, but um, I haven't had the chance to complete a, a fully formed peer review yet. But it'd be, it'd be interesting. Maybe I could try using some of the questionnaire, the uh, checklists myself, posting it in that format in the free form comment, seeing how people respond to it. Maybe experiment with some of the checklists I can find and, and see see how that goes down in terms of facilitating engagement and how the scores used and then we can go from there i don't know what you think about that patrick that sounds like an awesome idea it, yeah it would be great like if you use just the checklist in your own review and then just yeah see how good that looks um the, the other thing i think too is like questions that go into a peer review like this like it's just it's a challenging thing to standardize it and have it apply to like every field of science so I imagine this is also going to be something that's sort of like our reward algorithm where there's a lot of iterations and we'll, we'll probably try something standard and like, you know, continually be seeking feedback, um, trying to achieve like a, a better standard over time. We could use bounties to help there. Bounties for like peer reviews themselves or like on improving? Like people who who have um, expertise in the different academic fields and be coming up with different ways to, you know, review specific papers. And then, you know, perhaps other people in that field can comment on that and, you know, go from there. Well, that's actually sure. an interesting idea. So like hub specific, like checklists in peer review. So that way you don't have to have something universal for every field. Yeah. I don't know. Just thought of it, but. I, I think eventually we'll kind of go into like a hub specific kind of frame of mind where maybe different hubs have different ways of rewarding, you know, content, like different types of peer review, different editor cultures. Like, yeah, letting each hub or field have their own um, culture, I think is a cool thing. I can see why it's too early for that. So, yeah. Would it help if I if I also try to do something similar to what Nathan that uh, want to do? Like basically, uh, how I structure my peer review was 
I went over the introduction and be like, okay, is there a sort, sort of like a context? Is the context clear? What is the novelty of this paper? It is that, you know, concept clear. Um, then materials and methods, are the materials and methods explained in a way that are understandable? Did the authors miss some, you know, important steps that makes it difficult for me to reproduce, you know, what they, what I did? On the results, uh, were they fair, like in the way they presented it, in a way that, you know, they kind of like tried to obscure something? Did they go over some, you know, reproducibility? How many times did they try what they did? Uh, did they test it in different conditions and so on? And for the conclusion, it's just, uh, I just used it in a, you know, sort of like a paragraph to overall give a comment on the on the paper. So I think I could do that with most of the, the engineering papers because they're structured in this way. And actually most of them, they also have some specific like categories for like, like for example, sensors, they have, you know, sensitivity, selectivity, you know, reproducibility and so on. So you can kind of like structure even a table uh, as they do in reviews. So that could be something that I could, you know, start thinking about, at least in my field. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, that sounds like a great overall structure. And it seems like, Nathan, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like pretty similar to when I looked up like the Cochrane stuff. So it seems like people are kind of on the same page. Yeah, I think it might make sense like at the end of this month, like to just have a call where we can maybe collect a bunch of different checklists and work together to merge them or pick one that we want to go with initially. Um, so that way we can just have everybody on the same page and like, you know, ha have, yeah, just a, a bunch of different people thinking about what exact categories are going to go into this like, you know, eventual overall peer review score. Yeah, I'd be very happy to to have a call like that and go go over these things. And that gives us time as well to maybe experiment with some of them as free free text comments as well, see how people respond. It's a great idea to do them just like go ahead right now in the free text. That's a, that's a great thought. I like that a lot. Just writing that down. Um, so what do, you, what do you guys think of like the um, UI for the score? Do, do you like how it's kind of positioned? Let me, uh, I can share my screen just to help show it off. So we've got this up here. And then also this in the comment section. Do you guys like this kind of like bar paradigm for like the peer review score and the colors? Yeah. Yeah, um, I guess like delineate between comments and obviously there's a little like on it. Um, I was wondering if do something eventually. There's 30 uh, to splitting up tabs. Like, I wanted to just view tab, I want to just look at peer review, look at the peer review. Can you guys hear Jeff? It was kind of cracking up. No, me. I couldn't yeah. hear him. No, I can't hear you, Jeff. It's so, yeah, choppy. It sounded insightful, though. <laughs> yeah, it sounded like you had a lot to say. Yeah. It's fine. I can make one comment in the meantime, um, which is that I, I don't know, at the moment, a peer review score out of 10, I don't know quite how to interpret that because I think, you can go at it from two ways. Is it looking at the validity of the methods? Is it looking at how interesting the study is? These are all aspects of peer review that can be performed, you know, when a when a editor looks at a submission to a journal, right? To be honest, most of the time they look at the interestingness out of 10 first before they even send it to peer reviewers. I think even in like a basic free text version, we need to split it into some basic categories. I don't know what other people think about that. Yeah, so, so I definitely agree with you. And like one thing that we think about too, like you're saying, like a, a 10 out of 10, there's definitely more information that goes into a typical peer review. Um, do, do you think like, ideally, if we had, you know, subcategories or whatever, how, how do you think that should be displayed? Like, could it be a 10 out of 10 where then you click into it and it tells you like the breakdown or like, how, how would you like to see that on the page? I like the score. I think 
So let's just take it one more step of complexity from here. Let's say we had two bars, one for how interesting is this paper or research impact or something like that. And the second bar is, you know, uh, robustness or, you know, you know, I'm just coming up with words off the top of my head, but you see what I mean, some critique of the methods. And then you have two scores out of 10. That would already be, I think, far more useful than, than this. Um, but then I, I really like your idea of then you could then click on each of those and see, okay, what were the peer reviewers saying about this? You, you know, almost like a kind of, then you click on the Amazon reviews and you see, okay, what have each, what has each reviewer said about each aspect and how they, scored it, how they informed the score that they've given. Interesting. Uh, Malik? Yeah, uh, I, I like I like that idea of giving two scores, um, but I also wanted to like like try to understand. Um, and then uh, earlier to what Jeffrey's comment was, um, or was it Ricardo that um, you know right now the peer review like function that we have it looks almost like a comment, and because these are already published articles, um, so I was trying to understand like we need, or or we should have like a clear like description where it says, oh, this is pre-publication peer review or this is post-publication. And what are the objectives for each one? Um, you know, because uh, one of the main aims for like, you know, peer review that we do is, okay, is this study like valid enough that should it be published in this journal or not? Um, and if there are errors in the study, then need to point out and let the authors know that, hey, this is what's wrong. So I was just wondering, like, right now, the, the peer reviews that I saw were all of published articles. Um, and uh, so so we may have a bar saying, oh, this is post-publication or uh, pre-publication. And then somehow, like, I don't know, have an automatic email or something where the, 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 the comments go to the authors uh, that, um, hey, um, you know, your paper has been blah, 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 peer reviewed by so-and-so, and you get that. Um, you know, uh, a notification. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, because there is like pretty different context in a post publication peer review versus pre publication, and we're definitely more in like the overlay journal kind of perspective at the moment. So yeah, I I understand where you're coming from, and I think we probably should have something like that. the The reason why we chose to just say peer review is it's like very simple. And like kind of the pre-publication and post-publication thing, that's like a, a little bit of an academic niche where you got to be really like in the industry to know what those things mean. And so peer review is like not accurate for sure because it's not like the traditional like peer review, but it's it's like a, a concept that even people very outside of academia, they can get a hold of what's going on here. Um, but I think you're right where maybe we can have like a little hover state or something that says like, hey, these, you know, papers were not like originally published in Research Hub. This is a post-publication peer review. You know, these have already been peer reviewed by the journal, you know, pre-publication fashion or just to, to help clarify for the actual academics who are like, hey, this is clearly not peer review, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, that's a, it's a great point, Mark. And then, and then, like one question I have before I move on to everybody else's hands for a second is like, does anyone not want subcategories? Like, does does pretty much everyone feel like there needs to be some kind of breakdown of this score, or does anybody want to leave it free form? I mean, I I like it. I think it should be broken down. But if I think if if you still want to keep it like this, uh. A way could be like justifying the score. Like I could readily justify why I gave like 10 out of 10. Because like, for example, I know other papers that are, were made in a similar field and that was probably the best that I read in the last couple of years. So I could tell you exactly why I gave that. So if you want to break it down, at least like give a justification of your score. Could be a way. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear this because um, it, it, Kobe was definitely rooting for it. He was even saying this morning during our instinct that we should be thinking about it. So. Um, yeah, very interesting. Thank you, guys. I, I guess Nick. So I just uh, also wanted to voice some support for the the idea of multiple categories. Um, it could be interesting if there was, you know, because when a reviewer gets a paper, there's all these variables that collapse into that binary 
yes or no decision on the paper. So there could be like an aggregate score overall, and then that shows broken down. And then it could be cool because you could have each person, they could expand on it in their comments and everything, but they could give a brief bit in there to say, oh, they scored the reproduce the impact factor of the data low. And then they could put a one sentence snippet. So then you could get that quick high level view of, okay, 10 people looked at it instead of reading through 10 lengthy detailed comments, you could just get the gist of each of those comments and then how that rating kind of came into it. And I think then it would also, it would help people reading it, but it also help us understand how people perceive papers too, because we'd get a window into what their thinking was behind the number that, that they gave. Yeah, I like that a lot. E yeah, even like, um, it, it does, somebody said earlier, like the Amazon reviews, where if we're in the methodology section, you know, everybody's given eights and nines, and then like two people give twos, you want to be like, oh, what's going on here? Like, is this a legit perspective? You know, do they have a good reason? Or are they just trying to play them a paper? Like, um, yeah, it's, it's a good point. That definitely, it's a lot more interesting even thinking about it, rather than having to dig through a big, like, block of peer review. Uh, Sapik? Yeah, uh, my point is kind of in line with what Nick has just said. Uh, so I was thinking that before uh, before anyone could sort of click publish on a peer review, we could pro uh, we could give them a pop up that uh, hey, we are just testing out this feature. We just launched it out. Uh, so would you be uh, would you be willing to give us a short breakdown of what led you to this score? And then the way Ricardo just told us it what was his breakdown uh, everybody could sort of be uh, prompted to give that breakdown and then about a month from now uh, in the call that you suggested we could have a look at those uh, sort of breakdowns uh, and see what was uh, a recurring theme that maybe we could implement uh, into the system itself uh, and also uh, a ui point i was not sure why the uh, the bar for peer reviews was different for uh, from the bar for the hypothesis feature, which is green and sort of thin. Right? So yeah, those are the two points I have. That's a that's a great point to stay consistent between hypothesis and the peer review, or at least like use similar styles. That's uh, very observant. Thanks. Um, yeah, and I actually like the idea too of like maybe like asking people to to break it down for us and just seeing where they take it. Um, yeah, we have like a pretty cool community. So it would be like, you'd, you would get a lot of information on like how different people consume papers. Um, it's a good idea. We'll definitely think about that. I guess uh, Kobe, do you have anything you want to say? Yeah, I think um, I have a couple of questions. So the first one, one of the, uh, one of the challenges I see is that um, most papers are just going to have a single review. So you're just going to end up, so this breakdown we we speak of, of like hovering and seeing like, you know, different stats are, uh, they might happen for some papers, but uh, it's going to be very, uh, very seldomly um, the case. So with that being said, I guess, uh, does anyone have any idea of how to get more papers reviewed and two let's say we did have this breakdown right so you can like uh, rate in different categories does it make sense to always provide like uh, in addition to your rating like some text information about like why you rated that way or like go with amazon style where it's like oh you just you know you can rate five out of five and that's about it i kind of have an idea of where <laughs> where uh, things should be, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. So, um, Kobe, I don't understand why you don't think um, a lot of papers will have peer reviewers. It's something like half of papers are even read. So it's already okay. half of papers won't get any peer reviews just because they've never been read or something. So okay. I think Maybe I with comments, like most of our papers, like, like a lot of them don't have comments. So it's kind of like, I guess, uh, similar problem mm. Ricardo? yeah so if that could help i could 
like already start with my peer review and break down the uh you know the score to actually you know give out you know like uh in very simple terms explain why i gave that score if that could help to you know uh for other people to do the same um, yeah i think i think ricardo that like the breakdown of the score um is honestly for me one of the most uh important things right now to help us like shape the ui etc because I was reading the Cochrane like uh, review and their consumer reviews and all the different types of reviews that they offer, and they rate in very many different ways. So I think, uh, and I'm not a, not a scientist, so it'll be really helpful to get like uh, the feedback of an actual like academic slash scientist to help us uh, with this uh, the different categories and breakdowns. Yeah, sure. I think what makes a lot of sense is, and I know this because I just got a grant back, and I think the way that the grant writers do it um, and the grant reviewers is like super ideal because they give you an overall score. So when you go on your like ERA Commons account, you see, hey, I scored a 24 and I was in X percentile. But um, so there's this overall score, but that score is um, created by a series of like subcategories under there. And then those subcategories um, also have descriptions from the reviewer on why they were given that way. It's really beneficial to the author of the paper if we do it for our, our case, because then they can look and see, hey, I, I submitted this preprint, for example, it got peer reviewed here. I know exactly the points that are a point of contention. And then when they say maybe they wanna go publish it in a journal after this, then they know exactly where the points of contention are that they can improve on. And it also helps like readers because then they can see visually hey, there's this open peer review, and these are the points that are often points of contention in the nine papers I've read. Let me make sure to address these issues once I publish. Mm -hmm. I've just got a couple of quick, yeah, I've got a couple of quick thoughts on the stand, on the, you know, single score method of, you know, giving an overall judgment on the peer review. I think for Jeffrey, what you were saying about that one score that you got that was really useful from the grant reviewers, I think a really key aspect of that is that when you submit grants to a single grant authority, you are assuming that all grants are being assessed on similar criteria by them. And therefore, the score that you're getting is comparative to any other submission that was given to them. I think the difference on Research Hub is that you're getting all these different peer reviewers all using seemingly completely different criteria for different subject areas so my 10 out of 10 might be this is the most interesting paper i've ever read meanwhile someone else's one out of 10 might be this is the worst conducted study i've seen do you see what i mean it's, and so so i think if we, we we can standardize the score and then the single score would be more helpful if everyone was using similar checklists and people were then giving their working through those checklists but otherwise if if we're going through an Amazon review approach for, for research, I think we it's more useful to just read what people are saying. On Amazon, I don't really look at the star rating. I look at what they said and use the star rating as a sort of just indication of what kind of a review this is going to be. Um, just going back to some of the points, um, Morlik, I think, made a really great point about how, like, in normal reviews, they make a decision on whether something should be published or not in their journal. I quite like that. I, I, I think it's kind of controversial, but I like the idea that if someone posted, you know, the MMR vaccine paper from 1998 showing vaccine causes autism, that you could have a review saying that I don't think this should be up uploaded. Like, And if there was enough people who, who posted that, we could flag it as like, okay, this needs to be looked at because we've had reviewers saying that this is just complete nonsense. Um, and then the third thing I was going to say very quickly is it would be nice to have some facility to create a dialogue between authors and the reviewers. Because I think this is a really common point of contention where a lot of the time when an author submits a paper, they are by definition the, the, the experts in their paper. They understand the methods way better than the reviewers do most of the time. And sometimes the comments they get back, they feel are kind of unfair because they haven't really the reviewers haven't really understood what was going into the paper it would be great if you could have that dialogue and the reviewers had the capability to uh, modify their review based on the dialogue they've had with the with the author yeah so so this is kind of interesting just to jump in for a second because it feels like like we're almost pushing towards pre-publication peer review here you know, it's like we, we've got this feature launch, it's kind of like overlay journal style, but like the real value here is like helping authors improve in a standardized way. 
And so I had a conversation with somebody earlier today who like tried to make a business where the idea was they would provide consulting to authors like before they actually submitted to journals to basically be like, hey, here's the weak points, like exactly what you were describing, Jeff. So may maybe there's a world where like Research Hub can actually have a business model where people who share preprints, you know, they put up a bounty for peer review on their like preprint on Research Hub. And then there's like actionable feedback that helps to like, like basically, yeah, find out where the holes in the paper are. And then authors can improve it, actually submit it to like a real journal. Um, is that like a realistic world whatsoever, do you guys think? Yeah, if we can only direct some of the people that publish on archive on our, on Research Hub, like that would be, that would be pretty big. Because I'm pretty sure like a, like 90% that like a lot of people would use our service because we, you know, we have a large like user base and, you know, people skilled in a specific field. So that would be a great, you know, especially if, as Jeff said, you have like this weakness, like for example, in the methodology or like this weakness, like this is not too novel, like improve on this one. That would be actually like pretty, yeah, pretty interesting. What is, um, how is a similar thing done now? So I know like some preprint servers actually offer it as a service. Like they'll like if you're ESL or like you need help like working on your paper, um, they'll like give you editorial services. I think you have to pay like 300 bucks or something like that, like 300, 500. And they just have an editor go through it um, and make it sound nice. So I, I think authors are paying money right now, you know, to get like some like editorial help. Uh, with their content before they actually submit it to like big journals. Uh, Nick. So <clears throat> first, I wanted to voice some uh, some support for what Nathan said. I think that allowing users to kind of be a fly on the wall for that high level conversation between the author and the reviewer would be really great just to get a window into what things are discussed. Um, and I was I was thinking about something too. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Cunningham's law, but it's talking about the best way to get an answer online is to pose a question and then answer it with the incorrect answer. And then someone would chime in. Um, so I was just thinking as far as people justifying their scores, if they're able to justify it in like a one sentence thing, then it would lower the activation energy for somebody else to come in. Because if they see a really low score on one, they're like, oh, this, this data was not reproducible. That might be more interesting to them in looking at it um, and kind of getting a quick blurb to really draw their attention in might make it easier than, um, I mean, that definitely having the higher detail if they want it, but having that lower amount of quick detail to kind of ease that transition in versus, you know, them just clicking next after that, I think would be good. Mm. Like a kind of like a conclusion, Nick, almost like, you did all your thing, you reviewed, and then you provide like a one sentence summary. Yeah, yeah, just something where, I mean, if we are if we end up going the direction of having multiple score options, just a little bit of a justification behind it, um, I think might be easier for somebody who just happened upon that page. If they had just one minute, they could really see what's going on and then be like, hmm, they gave this a two out of 10. I wanna see what's going on. And that would kind of pull them in and that might help get us around the uh, what you were talking about, Kobe, where we're worried that there might just be one review posted and then no one else would do a follow up because that review seems so comprehensive. It's almost intimidating to try to do that, which has already been done. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just out of curiosity, uh, sorry, Kobe. Did, oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, have you all seen F1000 before? This is like a, a preprint server that does uh, peer review just in the open. And they have a cool UI. So um, in theory, like they have this like kind of like front page where you can browse through articles. Some are awaiting peer review. Some have been peer reviewed. So if you click in, they have this right panel that basically has like the whole open peer review of the paper. So this would be like the first version of the paper that you can download. Um, I think you might have to sign in or something or I don't have the cookies, but, um, then like, you can see the first like peer reviewers, like peer review report and like, they have a little bit of a checklist and then you can also respond to it. So yeah, they have like a nice little UI where it, like has like 
pretty much what we're talking about a little bit. Like people actually do respond. Thank you. You know, thanks for sharing this. Minor changes, whatever. Um, but yeah, so we could do something similar to that. I think like pretty easily for preprints that are shared on Research Hub. Yeah, that that UI looks awesome. I I completely agree. On a, on, cool. on a side note, how do you feel about you know someone giving a two out of ten of a review and having their you know name there? It's something that maybe we're not you know thinking about because you know, but that could could be you know. I don't want to see a problem, but someone might be, you know, a little bit. Just think about it before actually giving a bad score. This is maybe something that we want to just like think about when once we iterate with the peer review feature. Yeah. So this is like a, a big deal because do you know PubPeer? Have you ever used PubPeer before? They're they're like online reviews of papers. The founder of PubPeer had to stay anonymous for like five years. He wouldn't even acknowledge that he made the website because he was scared of the like professional implications he's you know he's just making the website and so they let you be anonymous and i think it's a pretty important thing so we could do something we also have to make sure that like it's a productive environment and stuff and not just anybody's coming in and just flaming papers you know for no reason because that does happen on pub peer sometimes it's like not the you know most professional interactions and so i, I think we could do something where like if you have x rep or you hold x coins like then you get the ability to, you know, peer review anonymously. But maybe you don't earn any tokens from that anonymous peer review or something. Like it's just purely for like the health of the community, not making money. Um, the there's ways we could do it, but I think we definitely need to do something like that, or else people won't share like true opinions. Mark. Yeah. Uh just a couple comments. I was just uh, wondering, like, I haven't had any peer reviews in, in my hub, but are we having any gatekeeping by the editor of the hub for the review done uh, at this stage? Like if somebody just posted a review, would that go through the editor first before it goes live? So I think it's, it's just like a comment right now, and then editors are able to uh, delete uh, like spammy comments. So if you see a peer review that you think is like, not scientific or like, yeah, it doesn't belong in your hub. I think you're able to remove it, but that's the only kind of moderation we have currently. Because I feel like, you know, at some stage when we become really big and there will be like bigger professionals here, it would be nice if the editor um, can like, you know, uh, approve or not approve um, for various reasons, um, you know, just because, um, as you said in puppy or you know if somebody is just doing like you know random um you know comments about a paper for one reason or another then that cannot be caught and um the other thing i wanted to mention was come back i think we have discussed this before but if we are going for pre publication one service that a lot of institutions are and and scientists would um really find helpful is just the 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 language part of the paper for people you know working in non english countries um, and statistics, uh, you know, this is not the help that's not available to scientists who are not at big institutions. And uh, it's a lot of time that they spend trying to do that themselves, um, you know, and uh, if we have somebody to just help with that part of the paper, then we're, I think we'll be in business like really quick. So it's interesting you say that because I, I was about to send this product to Kobe that I stumbled across today, but then I figured it wasn't worth it, but it's like an ML tool that like automatically helps to like change authors um phrasing of things to be more professional and more likely to be accepted in journals so it, like has this it's read every paper ever accepted and it makes like phrasing suggestions and stuff and so yeah i think i think there's stuff that we can do to help like basically that pre-submission kind of editorial perspective Uh, Nathan? I know another thing that traditional um, societies and journals charge for, and they can charge, you know, quite significantly for this, I think it's hundreds of dollars, is um, formatting help for, you know, submission to some journals, and then also like the graphics design element of things, where I think, I guess, from certain 
we don't appreciate it but actually in certain places they might not have access to the software that would allow for you know creating high quality images from the data that they want to present uh and so we could we could also offer that as well um and then just uh, just a thought about you know how this has the propensity to become toxic i i do agree with that i mean there's some um uh, examples of this for example on twitter oftentimes um people do sometimes post people's research and then post it in quite a negative light. And that can very quickly become a sort of brigading type uh, event where pe people then come on top of it, claiming that, you know, oh, this research is wrong. But, but, but oftentimes that's fine, except oftentimes they're completely wrong and they've misunderstood the paper and they've misunderstood oftentimes the statistics or something like that they come to the wrong conclusion then everyone's diving in on their opinions on the conclusion that's why i think it's really important that the authors have a voice when they get a negative peer review and that actually you know if if we are to sway one way or the other we give the authors the benefit of the doubt sometimes we might give them too much benefit of the doubt but i, I feel like that's a better way of doing things than, than going the other way because that's when we get this negative reaction to people's research being posted you know, without their, their content on, on the site. We could probably do something where like, if the author responds to a peer review, it's automatically at the top or something like that. So that way, like it gives the visibility. Um. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I th we, we discussed it briefly, but I think we should probably reach out to authors who get uh, their papers peer reviewed, just to let them know, hey, your paper has been peer reviewed. Do you want to chime in? And, you know, I think that they might. Uh, Sapik? Sapik, do you have your hand up? No, but if not. Yeah, yeah uh, I was muted. Uh, if anybody else has anything to add to this, because I wanted to take it back to point that Patrick had brought up earlier, which was about uh, differentiating expert and uh, normal peer reviews. So I could uh, maybe chime in later on if, if we could continue this discussion. That sounds good to me. I think Jeff actually messaged something here too. So it's good timing. All right. Uh, so one, uh, so what I had to say was that we should not differentiate between uh, between the way we present expert and non-expert reviews because uh, I think that would be antithetical to DSI, basically, right? Because then again, we are differentiating people uh, based on academics, right? Uh, and one, uh, one thing that we could go ahead with to sort of decrease the amount of noise that uh, this lack of differentiation would generate uh, is when people are uh, going to write down a peer review, we could ask them uh, before they start writing if they have uh, any experience writing peer review, like sort of as a pop up. And if they don't, uh, we could sort of have a very short tutorial uh, in which in which uh, we could provide stuff like uh, our expert scientists use this process or use this methodology to write out peer reviews that are valuable to the authors right and then this is what you should aim uh, aim to provide with your peer reviews something like that uh, that could sort of hold their hand through their first few peer reviews but uh, differentiation i don't think uh, differentiation should come in yeah i i hear where you're coming from and like like I guess I always like trusting experts, you know, take it out of my hands kind of, but like it, it, it's a decent point that you make. And like at the end of the day, the argument should probably be able to stand alone regardless of who says it or who says it. Um, I, I, and I guess like in, in your mind here, Sapnik, with these like, uh, you know, like just everyone peer reviews, crowdsource peer reviews, they could be curated via upvotes and downvotes maybe if those upvotes and downvotes had like an expertise score where like if you're a phd in the field like your opinion of the peer review you know would have more influence than somebody who's like outside um yeah curious what you think right. yeah 
yeah that would be better i mean weighted scores weighted scoring methods but uh, no differentiation in the way that it's going it's an interesting perspective I, I totally see where you're coming from and i i could see it like resonating with a lot of people um edwin i was wondering do you guys think there would be demand for uh, study design where you know you, somebody before you actually like do the experiments can lay out what experiments you're thinking about and have other people comment on them to make sure that your methods it, you know it may not always make sense to do critique of the method after the study has already be, been carried on like having a way to get help before that I don't know if you guys think there would be a lot of demand for that but I could see that pretty being pretty useful to a lot of people yeah like pre-registrations I, I think would be super cool there's like this idea of registered reports too where basically people will share pre-registrations which is basically what you're describing like a plan for the research and then that pre-registration goes through peer review and it can be accepted so that way the authors have a guaranteed publication like no matter what their results show they're able to just carry out the experiments not have to worry about it being cool or not and then like it's guaranteed to be published so that could be pretty cool like if we you know did peer like a registered report style publication model um through hubs i mean i i love that idea personally i think it's like the best thing that we could do for science but so what know, are the downsides people don't use them very often this is like a, kind of like a new age like thing i think like elite just did their first one like they did the registered report like two years ago and the results were just published it's like a it's like a trendy open science thing but not that many scientists do it so why not because it's uh like at the end of the day it's more challenging like you're kind of like laying out like a path that you have to hold to and like sometimes like you can do research, find something interesting, bend the direction, you know, like 30 degrees into something that's more interesting. Well, why and, don't you design something that gives them that leeway then? That's possible, right? Yeah, I, I think we could definitely do something here. With, with the pre-registration specifically, I think that could, we could do something where people are earning money like basically they're taking risk but they're being compensated for it financially you know for doing so um yeah it's a it's an interesting topic though i think peer review on methods is a is a super cool thing yeah it just seems like it would be um like the the, the immediate sort of value add of having the decentralized peer review is just like you have more people looking at it so it's better um and and that's like improving something that's like already a thing but um there's still like a lot of unknowns and and the entire process isn't necessarily being optimized um so yeah i don't know it's, it's worth thinking about so yeah kobe it seems like people are like really excited for the like pre-publication is like where the actual mm -hmm. cool stuff can be done yeah on the on the pre registration one you could even like have people kind of like stake their coins on this pre registration and be like okay i want to have like some like like, like skinning in the game here and kind of like i like this i want to do, to see how it goes and users can even you know, like tip this pre registration i would tip that way more than an actual paper because that means you know i believe in like what you're doing and i want to see you know how far you go with this it also lowers the bar to expertise for participating in a project. Exactly, exactly. Like if you like the topic or like what someone is, you know, willing to do for for like a specific, you know, um, research idea, you can just like tip him and be like, yeah, just want to see the results. So, so this is the funding feature that we should do eventually, because you could like share at the very beginning of a project a pre-registration um, fast grants the way that they did their applications. Yeah. It was like five paragraphs. It was basically a pre-registration. And so, like, we could do funding via these pre-registrations that have peer review, you know, and, like, experts upvote them. Funders are like, oh, this is the one that all the, you know, quantum chemists, you know, think is the coolest right now. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of you know, directing funding through pre-registrations, I think, is a really, really interesting idea. 
um because we make the world a better place while also getting scientists more money is pretty cool and probably the scientists who need the money the most and, and are willing to like lay their plans out and see yeah. if they them. you know it's like they deserve the money uh yeah. nathan uh, am I right in thinking that one of the barriers to uploading pre-registrations at the moment is that this this fear of letting rival labs know exactly what what your experiments are, what what your plans are, so that they can either be copied or got ahead of or improved on, and then you know rivaled with? I mean, I guess there's a lot of similarities to building a new startup, right? There's this whole movement of like open building, letting everyone know what's going on, but then you've always got these competitors. I'm personally optimistic. I think you're right that, um, you know, if you there's a lot of advantages to doing it openly, you get people interested on board from the more funding. I, I think it could work. I, I just think that's what's going on at the moment. I think it's a very at the moment, it's a very, you know, uh, protective sort of suspicious environment uh, in terms of research and grants and things like that. Yeah, totally. There, there would have to be money associated with it somehow. Like Open Science Framework, I think it was like two or three years ago. They did something where if you shared a pre-registration and then ended up like posting data that was like clearly made using the same methods, then you got a thousand bucks. And so they they got like like a bunch of people to submit these pre-registrations, but like not that many actually tied them up at the end. But yeah, I think I think you're right, Nathan, where it's like the world's different, like raising money is different. Like it makes no sense to share your data when the only money is coming from the state funding agency. But now if money could come from like you know, everybody in this room who wants to throw five bucks towards like a cool genetic engineering study or something like then all of a sudden it makes a lot more sense to be out in the open talking about what you're doing, you know, like recruiting users, for lack of a better term, funders, like it's, just, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. Think of it like a podcast too, like Patreon, you know what I mean? Like you, they have, they're putting out content for free. You know, it's interesting to follow along with this content. And then they monetize their most dedicated followers, right? So maybe you're giving money to this pre-registration and that actually lets you like sit in with the scientist once a month and like ask questions about the latest data. Like maybe you get their ELN or something like that. Um, lots of different things. Okay, you so um, you have Sandrine to yeah. you just have to pay. Yeah, very quickly, uh, uh, I just put in a point that this could be also a useful utility for NFTs as well. Um, you know, if, if you put up a pre-registration you could then issue nfts for people who are on board and and that would also give it the identity tied with you as well yeah totally yeah so we'll have to talk about this at a later community call but we're going to decide like after peer review what feature comes next and one of the things we're thinking about is like nfts versus like a couple other things like what how can we start generating some revenue slash like continue to like build towards this sort of like journal-ish product um yeah so we can do another call later on and kind of talk about like what direction we're thinking about heading in um Malik? yeah um I, I like this idea about the pre-registration uh but i wanted to circle back to uh you know the earlier comment uh, by Satwik about you know, not differentiating between like experts and non-experts. Uh, but, um, you know, I believe that there, like, if we are, if we are going to make this like a professional grade, uh, you know, review that at some point there needs to be some gatekeeping um, and including like the conflicts of interest uh, on this or not, because, uh, you know, as open internet, is like, you, know, you can have like a, I don't know, a medication from one pharmaceutical company being bashed by somebody else, like a medical science agent for other and posting it as peer review. Um, um, you know, so um, there are there are a couple of those things that um, you know can cause um, issues, and either the editor has to have some control, or um, or I believe that the person who is um, doing the review has to pass through some sort of uh, prerequisites um, to say that, hey, they can do peer review or they can still always post a comment, you know, about the paper and s critique it in their way. But I think if you are calling it a peer review, then, you know, I believe there has to be some criteria and uh, just just my two cents. Yeah. And it may be a good strategy even just for adoption purposes, because I think the majority of academics would probably feel similar. I guess that's why 
I, I do think there's something to what you're saying, Sapik, though, where you empowered the average person to like be able to stand next to scientists. Um, I, I, the way my gut always feels about this is the Rotten Tomatoes expert versus crowdsource score, because there's always context on like, if it's like a 60 expert, but like a 95 crowdsourced, like, I know, I know more about that movie, you know, like, I, yeah, so I think there's something we could do there. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I guess we've spent most of the time talking about peer review. Does anybody have any like final thoughts here um, on peer review? This has also been amazing feedback. So thanks everybody so much. These ideas are like super good. We were talking about them a lot kind of earlier today. Um, yeah, so any last thoughts on peer review before we move on? Jennifer? Oh, I think I was just chime in that I, I think I'm in agreement on the side of, of still having a a different identifier for expert reviews versus non-expert reviews. I think that's helpful for everyone. I think um, someone who's themselves not an expert wouldn't really know how to differentiate the two. Um, and there's people who can sound very confident about something they don't actually know anything about. And so um, I think for actually just a lay user to um, to be able to differentiate it, you know, not depending on their own knowledge, but you know, those identifiers is important as well. Yeah, I, I feel similarly personally. Um, and maybe there's like something where like the differentiation is like in a pre-publication peer review versus post-publication because pre-publication in theory would have to be experts in the field, you know, relevant field. And then post-publication could be anyone, you know, once we get there eventually. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a tough thing, but I, I think I'm with you, Jennifer. I feel kind of similarly where I want an expert to tell me, you know, if what I'm looking at is legit. Um, Nathan? Yeah, I just wanted to make a gen general comment on this, which is that I, I do think it's really important that we get this um, nailed down because I'm just thinking of past instances where on uh, sites like Twitter and things like that, you've had very contentious topics at the time where proper peer-reviewed research has been at its most important. For example, in the early stages of COVID-19, when people were propagating hydroxychloroquine, when they were propagating ivermectin, and you had a small number of experts saying, actually, there's no data to, to support this. There's no randomized control, control trial data to support this. And, and yet there was just this wave of people who could could be experts and then all these supporters who are so fixed in their belief that it is real, that in any crowdsourced metric, I suspect it would have looked really good. Um, so, so if you had a scenario where any lay member could post a score versus the few experts on the topic posting a, a counter narrative, it would actually look very, very bad compared to what the reality was. And so I, I think this is something we've got to get get nailed down because just by by you know the nature of this site it promotes you know interesting papers the most relevant papers and then you know the next time a, a situation like this arises I can imagine that the top of the hub will be one of these papers um, yeah that'd just be my comment on it and kind of even building off it I, I read something that like even within the expert pool on Twitter like it's not even the expert experts it's like professors who like are good at social media, you know, so like it's when it's like we're talking, having epidemiology conversation, it's not like the absolute top of the field is there in that conversation on Twitter. It's like some, you know, professor who's probably, you know, clearly a, a expert in epidemiology, but, you know, as the Twitter following. So yeah, I think like taking into account real life expertise and somehow baking this in so that way, like, the people who are at the top of their field currently like you can see that context in the reviews that they share and the weight until like you know whatever peer review score i think is probably important at least to get started uh jennifer uh, one of the things i'm wondering about is how that is measured though what is considered an expert um because so i and i come from inter uh, like intellectual property patent law and we usually use the term like one of ordinary skill in the art when we're talking about what um, how to determine whether something's kind of an obvious invention or something that's novel. But um, that seems like a very different uh, level than saying expert, right? An ordinary skill in the art is someone who could be working in the field, but an expert is someone who must have 
I don't know what studied it for, you know, all the way to this level of PhD. And so I'm curious how that is, um, how we would determine that, how, you know, and, and whether within that, between you lay person to expert, whether there's levels there and, um, but, you know, obviously someone who's kind of somewhere, you know, in the middle, maybe with a bachelor degree or has worked in the field 10 years versus someone who's worked, you know, 20 years, you know, is there going to be differentiators of that or, you know, anything like that? Yeah, so, so we should actually do a call on that this week and I'll write that down for anybody who wants to, to jump in. But part of this next sprint, we're going to take a look at reputation. And so like in theory, reputation should capture this in a way where like, like a, you know, total lay person has a different initial reputation score than like a undergrad in biology who has a different reputation score than a master's student who's different than a postdoc who's different than somebody with a bajillion publications. Um, and trying to, to tear things out like uh, reputation wise on the site. Um, and I think this could, you know, be something that we use in a lot of different features, but like uh, even weighting the peer review scores. So if you're like, if we, we'd have to have like pretty specific hubs too, but like if you have a, you know, a million publications in biochemistry, then your opinion's worth more than me, you know, because I just have like a master's degree, you know, in biochemistry. But my opinion's worth more than Kobe's who like did his work in computer science in uh, um you know, biochemistry paper. I think that would be pretty cool and make a big difference. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, I just wanted to give a quick nod to Satvik's in initial point, though, um, because I, I think it's it's good that we keep the, you know, vision of Research Hub, in, uh, at least the original vision of, you know, decentralized science in mind, which is that I think there is this sort of sense and this suspicion from lay members of the public that these publications in the top journals are kind of pronouncements from this non-transparent class of self-appointed elites and you know it, maybe you know someone coming at it from a different field looks at it and goes this looks like bullshit to me um you know and i can show you why and actually maybe that person should have the ability to have their voice put up if, if what they've put out merits it and is determined by the community to merit it have that voice be put up on you know a, an equal playing field to an expert if if the situation dictates it and if we're looking at the history of science like the experts have been wrong a lot you know <laughs> so like i think it's it's good to be conscious of that and i wonder like this is probably pretty complicated you know for the stage that we're at but like i always think of um like one thing of uh, Baji always talks about on his podcast was how he was way against shaking hands before anybody else was. And people were like, oh, you're not paying attention to the science. Like this is, you know, like hocus pocus, whatever. But then he ended up being right. So like if there's some kind of like way we could measure like an early detractor from the experts, you know, that ended up being like right over time and then give them expertise based on that, like, like make it so you can become an expert, you know, if you're smarter than the experts when it comes to like actually interpreting things. Um, so can I say something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so how do you guys calculate reputation right now? Because I think uh, like the fact that that's a little bit of a black box, there's a lot of value that can be captured through building reputations. Um, on the site, um, if it's made more explicit, specifically with NFTs, I think that could be potentially like a, a way that people could specialize on research hub that could be pretty good. So, yeah, it's a great question, and and like to be totally honest, it's probably not worth getting into right now because we're gonna retool the whole thing. So, okay. like, I think it's I think it's like worth doing a call maybe later this week, and we'll have Pat join Pat Lou, who's gonna be the one working on this, and we can like talk about like the best way to do a reputation score because i do think that's something that's missing now and you're right like it is black box like i don't even know how it works and like if you look at our leaderboard like it's kind of all over the place so mm. um yeah definitely having the reputation like reflect real life science expertise i think is important just to you know, make the website look legitimate um I guess, Jeff, so we're at like an hour now. Do you want to like quickly do some of these other topics? Like if there's important stuff. 
Um, yeah, I think the last topic, which was like kind of how the RSC rewarding correlates to reputation, sounds like it would fit in that um, meeting that you're talking about, Patrick, maybe later in the week. So maybe we can discuss that then. And then two and three are kind of coupled together. Um, and maybe Ricardo can elaborate on them, but um, they are in relation to kind of some of the posts that have been popping up on Research Hub with regards to like suggestions on like how to change the platform or feature requests and um, maybe how we can um, clarify to users wh where to direct those posts versus like science and academia only related posts on the platform. And then um, kind of bringing to light um, kind of the guidelines in a more visible way. Okay, so if I, I repeat that back, um, in theory, the, the posts that are in like the research hub hub, like making feature suggestions and stuff like that, like, um, we, we should try and keep those like uh, off, like on GitHub, basically. Is that is that what you're thinking, Jeff? Just to keep the homepage looking nice? Discord also. Discord. Yeah, yeah. yeah feature requests on Discord. We have a channel for it, um, but or on GitHub or something like that, because it seems like if we want to like, because like you look at the trending and the trending is like, Research Hub needs to be more understanding of the hubs and like, you know, yeah. it kind of detracts from like, really quality science that should probably be more on the trending feed. Kobe, can we block the research hub hub from being on trending? Yeah, I can uh, I can easily remove it from the trending on the homepage. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think about, yeah, I can do that. The question is like, how would people be made aware of such a thing? Maybe we can uh, have people post on research hub, like hub, and then in addition post on Discord, letting people know that they posted. Anyone has any thoughts about that? Uh, I think like uh, Jeffrey, I think he made a comment, like basically explaining in very simple terms that we have a channel dedicated to like feature requests and uh, discussion on, on features. So that could be discussed in, in, in Discord. Because apart from, you know, having the possibility to actually brought up all the suggestions, these posts are actually those are most discussed. Because there's a lot of people that want to just chime in and put their comments. So they're always at the top. And as Jeff said, it doesn't look great if we want to promote science. So just if you want to suggest something, we have Slack. We have actually we had Slack. So we have Discord and all the conversation on this kind of thing should be on Discord. It's also easier to actually interact with other people. I guess the one thought I have though, and Kobe, let me know if you feel the same, but that peer review, like it, it, we got like a lot of people who chimed in. And it, I think it's just because of where it is on the right. forum that like more people are willing to like, because they're already there like they'll share their comment rather than like going to GitHub or like, you know, going to Discord. So I'm wondering yes. maybe if there's something like we remove it from the homepage, but every time we release a new feature or want people's feedback, we give people a notification that then pushes them to that discussion or something. Yes. And in addition, like uh, another point to be made here is if we move away, just like we did from Slack to Discord, and then one day we're like, oh, you know, Discord is not good. Let's move to something else these conversation will be lost and it's very good uh, i think in my opinion to keep them on the platform where they're going to be saved for forever and i think it's very nice that uh, people can earn rsc on uh, providing like uh, meaningful feedback mm. yeah. <clears throat> if that makes sense yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. i like it like a, in my head like i think it it was a great, I guess maybe like more for like the team to get uh, feedback from like a lot of the users. I think that makes a lot of sense. Like the post that you made, Kobe. Um, I think like mm -hmm. when you have a bunch of people that are just gonna start, maybe like if it's possible to like have it only be like kind of like the research hub team can make those posts, but maybe not everybody yeah. else and everybody else can filter that through like the that Discord feature request channel. That makes a lot of sense. Cause then it starts to look like a subreddit more than like us like getting feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, actually yeah. like that. Maybe only specific people can post in the. Yeah. yeah and Maybe just the team. It makes sense. Even just the team, because otherwise, like anyone can just like come up and be like, "Hey, I want this," or "I think this doesn't, you know, doesn't go as expected," and so on. So I think it makes sense if you have the team just posting on that. Mm hmm. Yeah, I like that. That's a good suggestion. And regarding the, the second thing is uh, some, some people reached out to me uh, in DM, uh, kind of like asking why they were banned or like what, what happened with the accounts. And uh, 
I think we should probably make a, a do a better job in making clear what are the sort of like posting guidelines. I know we have them, but they're like kind of barred in at, you know at the bottom. You have to click help, and then you open the Notion page, and you see all the posting guidelines. Uh, we just have to make sure that comments like you know cool, interesting, and so on could be considered as bots because they're you know rather simple, and we want to encourage more thought through conversation. So just making that more visible for people that you know. You know, at least we, we made it visible and you knew that you should have commented in a different way. And also that gives more emphasis on, you know, our upvote feature. So you know that an upvote means I support this opinion or I think this is great and, and so on. And for any other thing, you can comment. I think somebody mentioned this last week, um, but like on uh, our science, whenever you post something, they have the, like the auto moderator bot that's like, hey, this is our science. Just so you know, if you don't say anything scientific, we're going to you know ban the shit out of it so i i think that makes sense right like where we could have like you know every single paper immediately research hub mod team you know says like hey this is like science you know we're talking about science here's our like uh community rules or whatever like here's what we have expectations of you if you don't do it it's going to be deleted um and then like with that being said we're also working on uh this sprint basically uh a bunch of tools to help editors um, maintain quality within their hubs. So basically like an editor dashboard that'll kind of like help us be able to like, I think maybe even give people specific reasons why their like content's being removed in order to help like push them towards like a better direction. Ricardo, is that kind of, do you think that would help do the trick? Cool, Kobe, do you have any thoughts on like the, the content quality stuff? Well, we got everybody. Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, in addition to to what you just said, Joyce, one more thing we're working on is the ability to flag content. So, um, as you mentioned, Ricardo, like we need to make sure like people are understanding why their com uh, content is being banned, and um, one way to do it is by flagging content, um, and that flag content will end up in the moderator dashboard. And in addition to that not just flag content, but any content will actually go through the moderator dashboard for them to review um, and they'll be able to reject it and maybe even give a reason why they rejected it or something like that. So uh, when it comes to getting reasons why content was re would, would be rejected, they would be made aware um, because you know we really want to raise the bar of uh, quality. So that's what we're thinking about. Um, and by the yeah. end of the sprint, we should have the tools in place to do it. Yeah, the idea is that we we don't want to punish people. We just want to keep a specific, you know, standard for the content we got on the platform. So if people ask, right. I mean, I'm just sorry to say that, you know, you were that your comment was was considered like coming from a bot. I mean, I'm sorry to say that, but there, there's a reason behind it. So we want to make sure that you also understand why that happened. And, you know, we of hope course. that doesn't happen again. Yeah, and exactly that, like uh, once your comment gets rejected for any reason you will know exactly why and another thing you made me think about ricardo is um like i'm thinking even when someone goes to post a comment like the posting guidelines is really hidden in another page i'm thinking of as soon as you put like put your cursor and focus on the comment box we might be able to like pop open like a thing on the side saying like by the way these are our guidelines please follow them one two three uh, just so you're like super clear about what we want you to write and what we don't want you to write. But just I mean, as an idea, I was. Uh, I, mean, if, if, I mean, if that's not too difficult to make on an engineering standpoint, that would be awesome. Like having like, I don't know, two or three sentences, pretty simple. You're just like, hey, just a reminder, you should not post this and this and that or like comment like this. Yeah, I love that. For sure. So just uh, before I forget to, um, for the reputation call, is the same time good for everybody typically if we do it on like Thursday or something like that? Just for convenience sake, scheduling. Yeah, yeah. good for me. Thursday, yeah, works for me as well. Cool. Uh, Sapphic? Yeah, yeah, so I had two points about this, uh, about the previous point. Uh, wherein we were discussing RH versus Discord. Uh, I don't think that we should limit the ability of normal users to post on the research hub, hub but we should definitely limit the ability of uh, those those posts to, 
uh, to show up on Kendo, right? Because as the site grows, there will be a lot of people who just use the site and who are not interested or maybe not proficient in Discord or Slack. So, for example, I've tried sending uh, our Discord and Slack to a law professor, but he was interested in sort of browsing through the site, but not interested in joining this alien community, right? So there would be people who are interested in just the site and then they might have ideas for the site itself, right? And they should be sort of given a place to voice that, right? Uh, uh, and then maybe if, gets, if it gets like a thousand upwards, then it should show up on trending because it's serious, right? Uh, other than that, uh, there should be a provision for sort of uh, posts that are made by the core researcher team. Uh, such as Kobe's, uh, Kobe's post about peer reviews, right? Uh, and that could show up uh, the way Reddit posts show up. So, for example, uh, while r slash place was going on, I don't know if you guys saw it, but there was this separate box that didn't look like a post. It just said that, hey, this is going on, you could go there. So maybe a separate box with a slightly different background color could say, hey, we are building out peer reviews. Uh, and we would love to hear what you have to say about it. So that would that could be a way of going about it. I, I, I think it's a great perspective. And like the one thing that I really liked about Kobe's post is like, even for the passive consumers, it's like, oh, like this is a bunch of real people who are actually trying to solve a problem. Like it, I feel like it like humanizes the the website a little bit. And so I, I agree with you in that like, um, keeping an outlet for people to get in touch with that human aspect is probably pretty important and like casting that net as wide as we can is a good thing um so yeah we'll, we'll have to think about the research hub hub a little bit more I, I think the the problem of these posts that are kind of low quality showing up in the home page is a real one and we need to solve that but then i also think like yeah just the conversations have been really good and so like making sure that we don't lose that is also important and yeah having people like actually be able to feel like they can be heard is cool um cool uh, also so one more thing that i have to say uh so the way that we have a tweets channel on discord that automatically generates the links to uh, all of the tweets that we put out maybe we could have that integrated in the feature request wherein if anyone posts on research hub, hub it would directly post uh, on the feature request channel and then the community would see it there and interact with it there. I think we could do something like that eventually, like build a Discord bot. Um, it may be a little early right now, but I, I think getting there eventually would make sense. Cool. I think Malik uh, raised his hand. Sorry, that was by mistake. I just wrote in the comment. Uh, I, 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 I like what Satvik was going with. Uh, I just thought maybe create a new hub for that or something where people can have an outlet. Just a thought. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Um, I think we get to, to pretty much all of the topics, do you think? Yeah, yeah. I think we pretty much covered everything. Um, I wanted to, I guess, before like signing off, just wanted to uh, remind the research hub team also that like a lot of like the bug reports and stuff, people have been posting them in um, in the Discord instead of Slack. So there's like a few things floating around in there. Um, but other than that, I think that that kind of concludes any everything. So like if anyone has any other things to mention, we can um, we can tack it on to the next week's community call uh, unless Bianca is coming for the next week one. So um, in that case, we'll push it for a couple weeks. But if nobody has anything else to add, then we can probably just conclude the meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Thank you.